What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. Uh, I think this video is long overdue, man. I don't think I've ever done a video exclusively talking about Patrick Ewing. I don't think I have. But, um, of course, we go through the. Let me go through the fucking preambles. If you want to support Too Raw for TV, you can do so in the link provided in the description box below. Um,. And I do encourage you guys to come over and support me on Patreon. I do upload there very frequently. I try to upload there at least once daily. Um, all right, I got a couple of you guys subscribed over here, but I'm um, trying to get a lot of you guys over here, man, and make it Patreon Nation over on my page, man. Talk about anything you want me to talk about. I take requests and i um, able to talk about subjects totally raw and uncensored over there. Now, let me talk about Patrick Ewan, okay? Now, when I was growing up in the 1990s, <clears throat> Patrick Ewan was, of course, one of the greatest players in the league. Um, I guess you can make a, an argument that I'd say from 19... Uh, just going through my head here. From about 1989, maybe, to about 1994-ish, Patrick Ewan was arguably a top two center, maybe three center in the league. You know what I'm saying? Um, I don't know if there was ever a time when you could say he was the best center in the league because you can make an argument for other guys. You know, Kim Olajuwon to me, was probably the best center overall during that stretch. Though there was times when he had, for him, seasons where he wasn't statistically dominant. It could be partially to blame for the, the coaching philosophy and system that was in place. I remember, I think it was Don Chaney, he had that system where the Rockets were playing more outside in, which is stupid. I don't know why the hell you would, you know, be, be having guards being more dominant in your offensive schemes rather than the, the, the best center in the league. But, um, but you know, a lot of times more versatile, more athletic, you can do more things. But And then you had Dave Robinson, who before his injury in 1996 um, was arguably the most athletic, freakishly athletic center in the league. And he was... Um, you know, he, he could do most of the things Lajron could do. The only thing that he kind of lacked was, and many of us saw it, is that he kind of lacked uh, Olajuwon and Patrick Ewan's and Shaq's meanness and, and heart. And then, of course, you had Shaq coming in by 92. And Shaq would have become, in my opinion, the second most dominant center in history behind Will Chamberlain. But Shaq still was raw. Shaq had to develop into himself. You know what I mean? So Patrick Ewan... was still one of the top guys, but there's still some sense of disappointment in his career, okay? Um, I remember when I was a teenager, man, and we used to be, like, at the uh, lunch table in school. This is when the Knicks were still a good team, but you can clearly see that Patrick Ewing was starting to diminish as a player. And people would make all these jokes about Patrick Ewing, you know, you know, uh, as far as his... What I, what I noticed about Patrick Ewing is that I think in our community, and it's got to be said, it has to be said, man, I think he was a victim of a lot of self-hatred that we as African-Americans feel toward ourselves, okay? I told you, I'm, I'm too raw. I, I don't sugarcoat shit. I try not to, at least on my channel. <clears throat> We're taught to hate our, ourselves because of the imagery that we see on TV every day, you know what I'm saying? Um, the stronger your African features are, the more unattractive we are taught to, that we are. But what I noticed about Patrick Ewan, you know, Ewan has strong African features. Uh, something that we also see in a guy like LeBron James and Russell Westbrook, right? And what I noticed is that a lot of people just make fun of him, calling him a gorilla, you know, <clears throat> making gorilla sounds to intimidate, you know, to impersonate. Patrick Ewan, they talk about his his hands, he walks like a gorilla. And all these types of things that they did to Joe Frazier. You know what I'm saying? If you think that I'm kind of getting way out there with what I'm talking about.
But what all this mask was the fact that Patrick Ewan was a very accomplished NBA player who unfortunately was the victim of, I think, playing in the wrong era and some bad luck. Some of it was bad luck. Um, as a player, Patrick Ewan was, was awesome. Um, in his prime, before his knees really began to, to, to uh, deteriorate on him, uh, he was pretty pretty agile. Um, not the most agile player, but he was pretty agile. But what you saw in Patrick Ewan was a combination of the things that we see in Shaq and a Robinson. He, had, uh, he was seven foot one, two forty, so he had power. But he had a little grace when he was younger. He, he, he was explosive. He was mobile. You know, you see some of the earlier footage of Patrick Ewan, and it's more of him running in transition, you know, slam dunks and more power. Over time, as his knees began to, de- to, to, to degenerate on him, then you saw him transition and becoming more of a mid-range jump shooter. And Patrick Ewan became, uh, in my opinion, at least at that particular time in the 1990s, he had the best mid-range jumper of a center in the league. And, and at the time in history, now he's been surpassed by other guys since then who are bigs like Nowitzki and all those guys. But at the time, I thought Pat Ewan, Pat Ewan had the best mid-range jumper of any big in history. When he was on, he was on to the point where he could actually start knocking down three-pointers when he had to touch. Um... He didn't really have a lot of weaknesses. He was a capable foul shooter. He usually was around 70 to 75%, which is pretty good for a big man. He was a decent rebounder, um, but not a dominating rebounder. Um, He generally averaged between his prime 10 to 11 rebounds per game, which is pretty solid. But... You get the impression that he could have been a guy who could let the NBA rebounding uh, every year. I think what kind of hurt him in some ways was the fact that he had smallish hands for a big man. And um, that hurt him as far as rebounding. And I think it kind of hurt him with as far as passing. Um, he was not the greatest passing big man. Uh I remember reading one time that Michael Jordan uh, said something to him about his weakness. I think it was uh, his weakness of passing out of double teams. And that if he could never fix that, that it would hurt his chances of winning a championship. Because Patrick Ewan and Michael Jordan are friends. uh, And we're friends. And our friends. uh, But, you know, Patrick Ewan still was a great guy, man. A great player. And uh, it was so much buzz and anticipation when the New York Knicks selected him in the first ever uh, lottery draft back in 1985, which I think was fixed, by the way. But still, um, the New York Knicks, there was so much expectations for their team. Uh, they had fallen off exponentially since those Knicks teams at the time of the mid of the early to mid-70s. They, of course, won two NBA championships and appeared, and I believe... It was, uh, what, three NBA Finals they appeared in? I think it was three. I think it was three. But um, at the time, it was this expectation that this team could become a dominant team, at least in the Eastern Conference. You had Bernard King, who was doing his thing from a scoring standpoint, but the Knicks were still mediocre. Now, at that time, I believe... Bernard King had just suffered that injury around the time of the draft. Someone can correct me about that. Um, but the, but the and so Bernard was on the shelf. But people kind of looked down the line and thought that Bernard would be able to come back eventually. Um, and that he and Ewan could have uh, conceivably had a run. Because people still think about that Bernard King. But it took Bernard King a long time to come back. And, and of course, by that time, Bernard King's services were no longer eventually needed for the, by the New York Knicks. Um, but Patrick Ewing still delivered individually, okay? 
as a player, he de he delivered. Um, I believe he was rookie of the year his first year. I don't know his numbers offhand, but he generally was a guy that was putting up like 24 points, 11 rebounds, you know, maybe one assist, and he was a a, 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 a huge shot blocker. You know, what I'm saying he wasn't the best in every category, but he did he was. He, he did well in almost all categories. He was a good all-around big man. Um, I remember he had one year where he averaged almost 29 points per game. So in his best years, he was a big-time scorer. Uh, had a couple of 50-point games. No, one of them was against the Boston Celtics. Um, he just destroyed Robert Parrish, who was one of the best defensive big men in the league at that time. At that time. Still, uh, as he was getting into his 30s, he was still one of the best defensive centers in the league. Uh, the chief, Robert Parrish. Um, but the, the funny thing about Pat, Patrick Ewan is the fact that in some instances you can look at it and say, damn, his best years were kind of wasted because he played on these terrible teams. You know, from 85 to 90, when he was at his absolute best, not in going into 91, when he was at his absolute best, he played on these terrible teams, you know, for the most part. It wasn't until 91 when Pat Riley got there and he put the pieces around Pat Ewan to have a successful team. It was only then that Patrick Ewan started having actual team success. But unfortunately, Patrick Ewan was already closed in on 30 years of age. So his prime window was narrowing. All right. And the New York Knicks almost unexpectedly dethroned the 67-win Chicago Bulls that year in the Eastern Conference semifinals. It was a big, uh, it was a surprise. But that team, I remember Bruce Bliss did a video some years ago. He thought that the 92 New York Knicks had the best perimeter defense in NBA history. But a great argument could be made for that. You know, and that team was just brutal. You know, even the bad boy Pistons could look at that team like, damn. Nope. <coughs> Excuse me. Shit. <coughs> oh. <coughs> I'm not going to make a comment about that. I mean, some fucking peanut butter and shit. Shit almost went down the wrong fucking pipe. God damn. That's why I shouldn't be eating while I'm doing videos. But anyway. The next year the Knicks earned the best record in the NBA. They won 60 games. Tying the franchise record. And um, they powered through the season. I think they had the best home record in the NBA that year. Or the second best record. I think they had the best home record in the NBA. I think they were like 37 and 4 at home that year. And um, they won like their last 27. They won 27 home games in a row, I believe, at that time. And they took that to take an old 2 lead against the defending champion Bulls in the 93 Conference Finals. So Knicks fans had to feel like, okay, now it's our turn. All of us Knicks fans who've been patiently waiting for the past 20 years for a championship team, now this is the payoff. Patrick Ewing, all of those years of, you know, frustration and, and, and hurt as far as playoffs concerned, now we're ready to do what was destined for us Knicks as New Yorkers, championships. Michael Jordan and company had other plans, and they did to the Knicks what the Raptors did to the Bucks this past season, which is won four consecutive games against them, including ending that 27-game home streak. And um, Michael Jordan retired. So then the feeling was, okay, the guy who the media proclaims the greatest player of all time is now gone. So this makes, this, this, this makes the NBA wide open. So who's going to take the reins and become the champion, the best player in the league? Many people thought, look, it should be Patrick Ewing, the Knicks, 
They they battled the the Knicks, uh, excuse me, the Bulls, the toughest. It's their time now, and it looked like it. Although the Chicago Bulls damn near beat the Knicks without Michael Jordan in '94, which actually was a precursor to, for things to come. Um, many people took that as saying that, "Whoa, Michael Jordan's overrated." Look what the Bulls did without him. When they really should have been saying. You know, this isn't the same Bulls team from last year. Look at these new pieces that are added. You know what I'm saying? Look look at this guy, Luke Longley. Look at this guy, Steve Kerr, Ron Harper, Tony Kukoc. Wow, this is a good guy. This is a good player. You know, they should have been looking at it like that. B. John Front had a hell of a season. I think it was the only year he was an all-star, as was the case with Horace Grant. I think it was the only years that they were actually all-stars. Um, Scottie Pippen was coming into his own. Uh, it was absolute best years, in my opinion, with 93, 94, 94, 95, and the very beginning of 95, 96 season before he hurt his back. That was the best we saw of Scottie Pippen, that two-and-a-half-year period, in my opinion. Um, but the Knicks were able to beat the Bulls, of course, without Michael Jordan, and then ultimately they went on to the NBA Finals. But it was not to be. It wasn't to be, you know. The Houston Rockets went on to win the championship, and Patrick Ewing, though he led the series in rebounding, he only averaged 18 points per game, and he only shot, I believe, like something like 36% from the floor. Some of it was Elijah Wan's great defense, but some of it was, and I have to say, choking. I mean, when you... Miss 20 shots in a game multiple times, and you only lose the championship by six points in a seven-game series. Uh, some of it has to be you choking, okay? And then from 95 on, which Patrick Ewing slowly declined as a player, and although there were some still good Nick teams, <coughs> in particular 95, 97, in 99, of course, he went to the finals, but that was larger without Patrick, larger without Patrick Ewing's contributions. Um, Patrick Ewing as a player slowly began to decline. Um, you know, he lost a lot of his explosiveness, his quickness, whatever quickness he had, and he became more and more of a mid-range jump shooter. Um, he wasn't as dominant a shot blocker. He wasn't the rim protector he was in the all the way throughout his career until the mid-1990s. And um, it was sad to see him become a journeyman in the last couple of years of his career. Um, I think he had a, t a stint with the Orlando Magic. I think it was the Seattle Supersonics, then the Orlando Magic. And he was just a shell of his former self by then. You know. But I know one thing. Nick fans would live, I mean, they would kill, excuse me, to even have those, what was considered bad seasons back then now, you know, like a, a season where they won 46, 47 games was a bad season. Knicks fans would kill for that right now for a Knicks team. And you, you just get a sense that the basketball guards, are, are, are they angry with New Yorkers? You know, it's just a constant wave of bad, you know, breaks and, 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 and terrible maneuvering by the organization since then. So that's it, man. You know, Patrick Ewing, he was a monster uh, in Georgetown, absolute beast. He had a great career. Um... He's a Hall of Famer, but unfortunately, in my opinion, a lot of his prime was wasted on bad teams, bad coaches, or coaches that just didn't fit, you know, with him at least. And um, unfortunately, he played during the era, era of Michael Jordan, you know, and even a couple times he was thwarted by a guy like Reggie Miller. So, you know. But there's no shame in that, man. You know, Patrick Ewing was and still is one of the best centers in the history of the game. And I think he need to be respected a little bit more than 
what he is. You know, I, I know there's a lot of people like to make jokes about him and stuff. Like, he, he's the guy that a lot of people, I think, next to Charles Barkley, he's the guy that people put out there the most as far as he never won. He never did, won. You know, he never accomplished anything. And yeah, he did. What he did was, when you look at it from now, New Yorkers would long for a player like him that brought back hope, brought back a sense of at least we have a chance. You know what I'm saying? Um, from 85 when he got there until 2000, I think it was, when he was traded by the New York Knicks organization. During that 15-year window, New Yorkers had a sense of at least optimism that this might be our year. And those battles with the Knicks were close. It wasn't a blowout like we've seen in some of these finals with the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Golden State Warriors or vice versa, you know, or whatever. Not vice versa. They were close battles. You know, and sometimes it took a Superman effort from a guy like Michael Jordan or uh, even some, a few games, Scottie Pippen. There was some hero that often came off the bench sometimes to make a miracle shot for the Bulls. Well, the Knicks didn't have that. But there's no shame in losing to Michael Jeffrey Jordan, is there? So Patrick Ewing had a great career.